Let me briefly introduce myself. I'm David Goldsmith. I'm the current uh, president of the Workplace Health Without Borders uh, in the US. And um, uh, I am very pleased to have everyone uh, in this webinar. Uh, this is a, a silica webinar focused uh, really on three uh, separate areas, uh, one involving um, countertop workers and the second involving co-workers pneumoconiosis and silicosis among coal miners. And at the end, I will talk about some of the newest data related to silica exposure and lung cancer and other diseases. Um, and um, I do want to say that WHWB is a voluntary, voluntary organization. We would welcome uh, having new members. And um, uh, later on, when you get to my presentation, you'll see the, our website. And I do hope you will uh, check us out if you are not, uh, not a member of WHWB. There's also an international group. And um, what I hope is that this uh, presentation will allow us to uh, uh, convene in 2022 more of an international global assessment of some of the same uh, and relevant issues going on. And um, so um, in this context, I would like to ask the audience to please um, Put your questions in the chat box for the speakers. We're going to try and um, keep the time uh, coordinated so that each speaker has about 25 minutes and uh, we'll have uh, time, a little bit of time at the end for questions. Uh, at least I, I hope we'll have some time for questions. Uh, Dr. Harrison, um, who's going to speak on countertop okay, uh, workers, has to leave off. a little bit early uh, because he has another uh, teaching engagement. So I think what we will do is have Dr. Harrison go uh, first. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I see a lot of um, colleagues that know very much about this issue who are on the phone. And um, I hope that this is an opportunity to really engage in a discussion and dialogue about this ongoing problem of silicosis caused by artificial stone countertops. And um, I, I'm also really pleased to, to be speaking to a group that I think may share my, uh, share my views that this is really a problem of global production, global trade, and global hazard in workplaces, particularly in smaller workplaces with the most vulnerable workers. Um, and I frame this as how our kitchen countertops are causing lung disease, because that's how I really see it. Um, this is a product, I call it silicosis in a box, because these products are 93% silica dust when they, you know, and 93% silica mixed, by the way, with polyester resin, which is interesting because I've really uh, seen some papers and wondered whether this could be a contributory factor to the severe forms of silicosis that we're seeing. I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, if you want to read more about the details of the cases that I'm going to present, um, you can read about it in the MMWR in September of 2019, which you can see was about four or five months before the pandemic hit in early 2020. And so I am, my team and I are just really going to pick up the threads of and to continue our research and our interventions that was put on hold since March of 2020. I have been told though that this industry was not put on hold, that I don't know what it's been like in the rest of the world, but in the United States, uh, there has been continued renovation and construction with the use of this product. Um, businesses have not shuttered. They've had trouble finding workers, skilled particularly who can fabricate and sand. But I've been told from my industry context that we're not talking about a dismantling of this industry by any means. Um, I suspect that uh, the silica dust exposures I was seeing in the fall of 2019, I'd still be seeing in the fall of 2021. 
Uh, this is a big box store in the United States. For those of you who uh, are regular uh, um, do-it-yourselfers, this is where ha about half of Americans go to shop for their hardware and other needs. And uh, this is happens to be, I I'll give it away. This is Home Depot. And if you go into Home Depot, like you would into other these stores, 90% of the products you'll see will be artificial stone. And they come in all sorts of brands and products, but the leading manufacturers probably have a good 50 to 60% of the global market in artificial stone. That being said, there are a lot of hundreds of companies that are producing this, um, especially in China. Um, so the first time that I paid attention to this, and I may be a little behind the curve, was when my colleagues published this paper in 2012. And this was from Israel. Um, and this was because Caesar Stone licensed the production technology from an Italian company and began producing artificial stone um, under the name of Caesar Stone on a kibbutz mm -hmm. on the Mediterranean. And this factory is still going strong, still producing Caesar stone. And this product hit the Israeli market in the mid 1990s. And by 2012, this paper reported on 25 cases of severe silicosis, half of them requiring lung transplant. One of the reports in here is a father son who was working in a small workshop producing, fabricating Caesar stone I'm not sure, they don't identify it, but I imagine it was Jerusalem or Tel Aviv where these cases were being seen. And it's quite interesting to me in this paper, you see that there's a big uptick in about 2009, 2010. And if you look at when Caesar Stone licensed this technology and be began producing it, it was in the early 1990s, which is you know right about you know a latency period here of about 15 years. But the first case was actually in 1997, and there were two more cases in 2000 and one more case in 2001. And I think what happened is there, you know, these sort of got subsumed into the surveillance system, the diagnostic intake of the tertiary care hospital. But then you saw this huge curve here, and they put together this case series. So I looked at this and said, okay, where is this in California? That's where I work, and I'm in charge of data collection and injury and illness data. In California, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. We have 40 million workers, a million workplaces. We have lots of artificial stone being sold in the California market. So I put out a blog, a NIOSH science blog with some colleagues from NIOSH in 2014. And I said, you know, is anybody in the United States paying attention to this? Is anybody seeing a case? One of the points I want to make here is that the U.S. does not have a comprehensive occupational disease surveillance system. Um, I, can, I can show you papers 30, 40 years old that are commenting on the same phenomenon. And um, there is no way that we have a, a national disease reporting system where if I'm a doctor and I see a case of silicosis and it's an engineer, an artificial stone worker, and I've taken my history, right? I've, 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 got, I've taken a decent occupational history. I see a case and what I say to doctors, if you see something, say something, right? And who do you say it to? And so I put out this blog and a week later, a pulmonary doctor in Texas writes into the blog site and says, oh, I saw a case. I said, really? So I reached back out through the blog, had a phone conversation and we collaborated and published what I think is the first case of silicosis in a countertop fabricator in the United States, which was in Texas in 2014. This was Dr. Gary Friedman who responded to that blog posting. That's how we found the first case in the United States. Um, but we all know, you know, this is a very ancient disease and we keep on looking and an epidemiologist who works with me at the state health department Jennifer Flattery came in to my office on January 9th, 2019. And she said, Bob, I'm working with our hospital discharge data. And I looked 
like what I found, I think could be an, a, a fellow, a young guy with silicosis from cutting stone. That's all she knew from the hospital discharge records. Mm -hmm. He had been admitted and discharged with silicosis. She said, okay, I'm gonna get the medical records. There's very little information in the patient discharge data. Because all we get is the diagnosis and the age. We don't get occupation. We don't get industry in our hospital discharge data. So it's purely suspicion, purely based on his age, because we're saying to ourselves, um, what, is a, what is a young guy with silicosis going to be exposed to? We don't have foundries in California. And, he, and if we did, if this was a historical exposure, he'd probably be in his 50s or 60s. So he turned out to be the index case to the whole puzzle. And when I got his records and I interviewed him, he had been employed at a stone countertop fabrication shop in 2014. In 2004, he had immigrated from Central America. He first worked in Los Angeles. He was transferred to uh, a shop in Northern California where I, I work. And in 2013, he had been diagnosed with silicosis at a large health maintenance organization in our state who I highly respect and admire for the quality of their comprehensive care, by the way. Um, by 2017, his symptoms worsen, his lung function deteriorates. He finally gets over for a lung transplant evaluation by, in 2018. Unfortunately, at that point, he's ineligible for a lung transplant and died of accelerated silicosis in 2018. Uh, we could talk at length about what happened here, right? This whole chain of events, right? And why I didn't hear about it in 2013. Um, so I call up his family to learn more about what he had done in the shop. And his brother on the phone tells me that the other brother had died of accelerated silicosis also, as, or as he put it, stone in his lungs. And I said, oh, yeah? Where did the other brother work? Where'd your other brother work? Well, he works in the same shop. So now we have two guys with accelerated silicosis who work in the same small shop. Now, in, in, in my field, I call that an epidemic, right? It's a sentinel disease. It's an epidemic of silicosis. And I, I'm, I'm suspecting it's the tip of an iceberg, particularly because they died of accelerated silicosis, right? Which is a form of silicosis that I have rarely seen in my 30 year career. I'm used to seeing simple silicosis, the chronic low level form with mild symptoms. And we've known about silicosis from many other contexts and industries. Um, hydraulic, fracturing, hydraulic fracturing merits a mention because um, our NIOSH colleagues here in, in the States have measured high levels of silica sand that's added to fracking. Uh, that's a new association. And we've known silicosis has been around since Bernardino Ramazzini in the 1700s and maybe even earlier. Um, and we know it, was, uh, it caused uh, progressive massive fibrosis and 100, and 100 plus deaths in the Hawks, Hawks Nest Tunnel in the 1930s. And um, it was the subject of regulation to prevent exposure in the 1930s by the US Department of Labor um, and the first Secretary of Labor under Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, this, this, in, this technology is quite interesting from a global production point of view. It starts in 1975 with the Brenton founder, Marcello Toncelli, who was an Italian engineer and he patented a process called vibrocompression under vacuum by taking a mixture of silica sand, stone, polyester resin binder, and phthalic anhydride. And the phthalic anhydride story is quite interesting also because uh, Aaron Tustin, a colleague in the medical office at Federal OSHA, is uh, going to be publishing a paper on both silicosis and asthma, a large outbreak of both of those simultaneously in a Texas US factory. Um, the anhydride is causing asthma, of course the silica dust in the fabrication department causing silicosis. This gets licensed to Caesar Stone. We have the first cases that I showed you from chest and then it gets licensed 
to Cosentino, which is a large Spanish manufacturer out of Spain. And they report, and, and a colleague from Spain reports the first cases by 2010. And by now, I think this is a, a more than familiar story. Cases from Israel now over 300, Spain more than 300, um, Australia, I see Dr. Edwards has joined, has, has joined our call. Graham, you may have some update on the numbers. Uh, this slide is a couple of years old and this is probably has grown since then. And then in the United States, our, our paper published 18 cases from California, Colorado, Texas, and Washington, including the two deaths. So this is clearly, if you look at the data and this is through 2018, um, I, I haven't had any more market data that, uh, that, I, that I have found, but you can see this rapidly escalating growth of this, this product uh, more than sixfold. Um, this also has highlighted the problems with autopsy diagnostic acumen of medical examiners. You know, after we found that index case through hospital discharge, and his, and his brother told me that there was another brother who died. Um, I got his autopsy report from the local county coroner's office. And the coroner had not done microscopic examination of the lungs. He felt the lungs and they seemed hard and nodular in his description. Um, he got a toxicology analysis that showed the presence of methamphetamines, and he called it a sudden cardiovascular death. Even though this man had expired in respiratory extremis, heading out of the CAT scan in the emergency department of a local hospital. And uh, I was able to retrieve the lung tissue with the assistance of one of my occupational medicine residents, Ryan Guinness, who walked, who, who went over to the coroner's office, got the formalin fixed lung tissue and brought it over to Kirk Jones, a nationally renowned, you know, internationally renowned lung pathologist who I work with. And Kirk looked at it and found alveolar proteinosis. Um, at which point I tried to get, by the way, I tried to get the death certificate revised in the, in, in the, just, just out of a sense of justice, actually. Um, and also in the case the family wanted to file compensation, they'd have at least the correct diagnosis as a cause of death. Uh, medical examiner refused. After a year of back and forth, just absolutely would not take Dr. Jones' pathology interpretation. So this is still gonna be registered as a cause of death in our death file as sudden death due to cardiovascular disease. Um, so we, we did a follow-up investigation at this company and as well as did um, extensive um, case identification, active case identification. Here's an example of an outpatient record identified from a discharge in a pulmonary physician's note. And you can see here's the guy with silica proteinosis diagnosed in 20, 2013. And you can see this is the occupational history. Okay, patient used to working as a granite installer. Um, you know, I ended up having to have a personal in-depth conversation with this doctor who tried to remember what this guy did for a living. Well, it turned out he worked with artificial stone. Um, his case, by the way, was on public assistance, um, never filed and received workers' compensation. Um, this guy was trying to get a lung transplant because he was on public dollars. Most of our lung transplant centers wouldn't take him. He finally got a spot at Stanford, but he couldn't afford to come up and live in Palo Alto for six months because it's so expensive to reside there. And he died, never receiving proper care. So we did an estimate of what magnitude we're talking about. And if you just take, if you just take the 12 cases we found in this one company and estimate that there's about a 12% prevalence. And I'm relying here, Australian colleagues on your data here. Again, you might correct me. We estimated 12% in 
if there was active detection by a chest X-ray or the more sensitive CT scan. And you just do some estimates on how many stone establishments there are in the United States. This is based on official labor data and the number of workers. We're talking, we're talking a lot of workers. We're talking 10,000, 10, 12,000 if they were truly to be identified with medical testing. Um, we have a lot of challenges and this is a global challenge, right? We have a good silica standard in the United States, um, but compliance, particularly in these small shots is very spotty. It's expensive, relatively expensive for shops to institute the proper engineering controls, wet methods, local exhaust. And the most recent data that we have from our, Cal o from our OSHA program that inspected about a hundred shops before the pandemic hit, about 60% of them had significant overexposures to silica dust. And this was in the fall of 2019. No workers had undergone the required medical testing. Um, and so we have a work in progress. We just received some funding from NIOSH um, to uh, initiate outreach um, and um, interviews, uh, education and approaches to the stone fabrication shops in California um, and to offer them free medical testing including uh, a CT scan and full pulmonary function, including diffusion capacity, um, as well as industrial hygiene assistance to help them with engineering controls. Um, so it's eminently preventable. We have a great, you know, a great comprehensive standard in the United States went into 2016. Um, we got great coverage. By the way, this is this fellow here was that 2014 case out of Texas. That's the guy. And he spoke out. Um, he, he uh, you know, was willing to be interviewed by a, a good journalist in the New York Times. This has also gotten excellent coverage by National Public Radio here, the public media in our country. And uh, I wanna thank Perry Gottsfeld um, for uh, working on this, um, putting out the word, um, passing it to colleagues in India and uh, getting picked up last, last week in a very good commentary in the Lancet, you know, uh, International Medical Journal. Uh, so with that, I will end and uh, just, just say I, uh, I uh, was, was touched in this whole process very personally because I've done dozens of interviews with family members and with patients and uh, Pedro Alacon's daughter, uh, talked to me at length about uh, spending her last six months with Pedro on a ventilator, gasping and dying of advanced silicosis and uh, allowed me to share a picture of her dad who worked in one of these shops. God. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. I have a very brief question and you alluded to it, but of the uh, cases that were summarized in that MMWR, could you tell us how many of those workers were in fact Spanish speaking? Uh, I'm just trying to get uh, a sense of this because I think this is much more of a serious issue in this worker community than it might be in the broad section, cross section of, of workers in, in the United States. Uh, great question, David. I, I didn't show you the data, but uh, five out of every six, so 80% are wow. primary Spanish speaking um, uh, probably uh, elementary to junior high education, but high skill. I mean, you know, producing one of these with exactitude and uh, care. Um, these are these are um, workers. These are folks that 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 come from construction trades background, um, and um, uh, uh, I, I, this is this is not only true in California. I think, but nationally in the United States. And from, from what I've talked with colleagues worldwide, it, it, it's an industry that is primarily of, um, of immigrant or migrant workers. Right. Um, and that's definitely true in this country. And it uh, yes. obviously it creates, it creates oh. large challenges. Yeah, and, and that goes to some of, uh, of 
my the reason for asking that is that I think that um, in collaboration with uh, investigators like yourself and others uh, at OSHA and at Cal OSHA, for example, in these state programs, there needs to be uh, an awareness that a lot of the training materials must be in not just English, but Spanish as well. And I think that you just reinforced um, that in your last comment. And I really appreciate that too, for sure. So um, uh, please, um, if you have other questions for Dr. Harrison, uh, feel free to contact him uh, and, and speak to him. If you have trouble finding him, please contact me. And I promise I'll uh, pass on any questions for Dr. Harrison to him. But now I'd like to uh, turn to my colleague, Noemi Hall. Dr. Hall is a, an epidemiologist at NIOSH and she is a, an expert on co-workers pneumoconiosis, which is often abbreviated CWP and silicosis. And she's gonna talk about um, what is really a su very surprising outbreak uh, amongst the Appalachian coal miners. Noemi, it's all yours. Again, I want to thank you for inviting me to today's webinar. And I also want to thank Dr. Harrison for that fantastic talk that you just gave as well. Uh, but my name is Noemi Hall, and I'm an epidemiologist within the surveillance branch of the Respiratory Health Division at NIOSH in Morgantown, West Virginia. And NIOSH, I'm sure, uh, feel like you all know that's the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. So first, I'll briefly describe the Coworkers Health Surveillance Program and its role in identifying disease among working coal miners. A uh, description of the respirable coal mine dust, including respirable wow. dust and silica in coal mines and recent findings related to pneumoconiosis among coal miners. And of course, I'll do my best to leave time for questions and discussion towards the end. So, in the 1950s and 60s, worker activism, including regional and national strikes for improved working conditions and disability benefits, and the Farmington disaster of 1968, where 78 coal miners burned to death in a catastrophic mine explosion, led Congress to pass the Federal Coal Mine Health and Safety Act. So this act was passed in Congress in 1969 to protect the health and safety of the nation's coal miners. A couple of key provisions of the act was that it established permissible dust exposure limits and empowered NIOSH to conduct routine health surveillance on active coal miners through the Coal Workers Health Surveillance Program. And this was to study the causes and consequences of coal mine dust related respiratory disease and to develop improved health and safety standards to protect the nation's coal miners. So since 1970, NIOSH has administered the Coal Workers Health Surveillance Program, CWHSP, which offers chest radiographs at no cost to coal miners at regular intervals during their career. Participation in this program is voluntary. So this program is unique to occupational health. Coal miners are the only US workforce for which industry-wide occupational respiratory disease data are systematically, systematically collected. And Dr. Harrison, referred to the fact that in many industries in the US, there's not systematic data collection, but here we do have that, uh, at least for working miners. So this data can be used to monitor trends in pneumoconiosis across the United States. And radiographic data from CWHSP has allowed NIOSH to study risk factors for pneumoconiosis and monitor national pneumoconiosis trends for nearly 50 years. An important purpose of CWHSP's radiographic surveillance is early detection of dust-induced interstitial lung disease, pneumoconiosis, in working coal miners and preventing progression to more severe forms of pneumoconiosis through reduction or elimination of future exposure to coal mine dust. In 2016, the CWHSP was expanded to include spirometry testing and symptom assessment. Prior to rulemaking in 2014, the program was limited to actively working underground miners, but in 2014 was expanded to include surface coal miners as well. And in much of our work in the CWHSP and throughout this talk, 
Uh, we focus on central Appalachia, which consists of West Virginia, Virginia, and Kentucky. And when we talk about Kentucky, we're focused on mainly Eastern Kentucky. Um, and we compare these three states in central Appalachia compared to the rest of the US. Now, currently about 40% of all US coal miners are working in central Appalachia. And over the past couple of years, uh, over the pandemic, of course, those nationwide employment numbers have fluctuated a bit, but it's between 40 and 50,000 coal miners nationwide. So here, I also want to say that there are a number of terms that refer to the same or similar disease arising from restful coal mine dust exposure. Coal workers pneumoconiosis, commonly known as black lung, is an incurable interstitial lung disease, and exposure to coal mine dust is the sole cause of CWP. Now, black lung, in turn, is a common term for a spectrum of coal mine dust-induced lung diseases, including interstitial lung diseases such as CWP, silicosis, mixed dust pneumoconiosis, and dust-related diffuse fibrosis. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, also falls under the umbrella of conditions which can be caused by coal mine dust, including chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Now, for each chest radiograph of a coal miner that we receive in the CWHSP, in order to assign a determination, we rely on the International Labor Office or ILO system for classifying radiographs. Their guidelines provide standardized criteria for evaluating and recording interpretations of minors x-rays. Certified B readers are physicians who've demonstrated competence with the ILO system by successfully passing the certification examination. And to briefly summarize this process, B readers classify radiographs by how much perfusion they see and by which type of opacity is seen by size and shape, rounded or irregular. So for discussions about silicosis, we'll be focusing on R-type opacities. And R-type opacities are small rounded opacities with diameters of three to 10 millimeters. And shown here, you see a standard radiograph from film. And these are the lungs of an underground coal miner showing the R-type opacities uh, throughout the lung, giving it a snowy appearance on the X-ray there. Now, we're interested in R-type opacities as they're associated with silicosis lung pathology. So these images here highlight a coal miner's lung, both an explant and a magnified view with areas indicative of silicosis. So th this is from a pathology study done by some of our collaborators. And this study looked at explanted lungs and existing tissue samples from biopsies and demonstrated that rapidly progressive cases of black lung were associated with exposure to coal mine dust containing high concentrations of silica and silicates. So in this example, you can see these classic silicotic lesions that appear swirled, especially highlighted on panel B in the top box. But uh, here we wanna know why would coal miners be exposed to respirable crystalline silica dust, which would result in these types of lesions. Now, as miners cut coal, they may also be cutting rock. And one of the ways that they access a coal seam is by cutting a slope mine through layers of rock to access the coal itself. And this practice of cutting a slope mine has been described to us by miners who end up with a severe progressive massive fibrosis. So, as they cut to access coal seams, once they get to the coal seam itself, uh, they may be cutting rock above and below that coal seam, exposing the miner to mixed respirable coal and silica dust. So you can see here a relatively thin coal seam. And using data from the CWHSP, here we see the prevalence of pneumoconiosis over time. From 1970 through August, 2021, among working underground coal miners in the US by region, with the highest rates seen among those long tenured miners working in central Appalachia in the center panel. So we can see uh, that 
first of all, I'd like to point out the black line, that top line, those are miners with 25 or more years of mining tenure. Uh, and so we can see that after the initial implementation of the Coal Mine Health and Safety Act, cases of pneumoconiosis decrease, but starting at about the early 2000s, pneumoconiosis sees a resurgence. So now, uh, even in 2021, 20% or one out of every five working long tenured coal, miner, uh, coal miners in central Appalachia have X-ray evidence of pneumoconiosis. Now this figure here also uses data from the CWHSP and it shows that nearly 4% of working long tenured coal miners in central Appalachia have complicated black lung or progressive massive fibrosis, PMF. And this is the most severe and debilitating form of the disease. Other recent studies have identified thousands of additional cases among former coal miners. So again, this, these are working miners that are featured here in this figure. The CDBHSP has a legal mandate to screen working miners. Because of this and the voluntary nature of the program, CWHSP likely only sees a sliver of all the disease caused by coal mining. Therefore, to understand more about the disease among coal miners, our group and others have started looking at other sources outside of the CWHSP. Now, this investigation, working within clinics in Virginia, identified a cluster of 416 cases of PMF, the largest cluster of PMF ever identified. Nearly one third of these radiographs, so 122 of them, had background small opacities classified as R-type. Again, R-type opacities associated with silicosis. So the past three slides have focused on underground coal miners. Those miners are not the only ones with the disease. There was an early survey of surface coal miners, so before 2014, uh, and identified surface coal miners with PMF. One of the miners took photos of his working conditions throughout his career and shared them with us. The top two photos you see there were taken in the 80s and the bottom two taken in 2012, right before this miner retired. He was a driller and blaster for his entire career. And these photos demonstrate working in and around the drill rig during the drilling and blasting process. So you can see that the dusty conditions didn't really seem to improve from the 1980s to 2012, at least not for this miner. And, ah, okay. So we also have, I didn't include them here, but we also have chest radiographs from the same miner. Uh, he received a chest radiograph at the age of 46, which did not have evidence of pneumoconiosis, but then a follow-up, a surveillance radiograph at age 57, was classified as having uh, category A PMF. So he progressed from a normal chest radiograph to PMF in 11 years and was forced to retire at the age of 57 because of extreme shortness of breath. And you know, surface coal miners have not always been included in the CWHSP, but as I mentioned earlier, 2014, MSHA issued a final rule enabling NIOSH to expand its screening to include all US surface coal miners in CWHSP. So looking at data from those first six years, from 2014 to, uh, through 2019, pneumoconiosis was present in 109, 1.6% uh, of surface coal miners, and that includes 12 miners with PMF. So even after taking working tenure into account, surface miners in central Appalachia and surface miners who worked as a driller or blaster were at increased risk of pneumoconiosis. And I'll point out here as well that uh, the data here is from 2014 through 2019. The miner uh, whose working conditions I just showed you would not have been included in this cohort because of the, the time frame. So 12 cases of PMF were identified here, and that doesn't include the gentleman I just described. Now, a number of studies have suggested silica dust or quartz, as MSHA refers to it, has played an important role in the resurgence of black lung in Appalachia. But in 2019, researchers from our group looked at MSHA inspector data from the past 35 years 
and found that the average silica content in Appalachian coal mines has consistently exceeded 5%. And that's the level that would put mines on a reduced dust standard. So if your mine exceeds 5% quartz content, then the permissible exposure limit for workers at that mine should be reduced. The average silica content in coal mines outside of Appalachia stayed below 5%. And we followed this up by looking at MSHA inspector data at surface mines from the past 35 years and found 15.3% of respirable dust samples containing silica exceeded the respirable dust standard. So additionally, the mean percent silica in central Appalachia was higher than the rest of the country. So overexposures to respirable dust containing silica have and do occur at US surface coal mines, particularly among miners in drilling and blasting occupations. And a team from Virginia Tech recently published this work led by Emily Sarver, examining particle sizes and mineral content of coal mine dust from 25 underground uh, US coal mines. And they found that the samples in central Appalachian mines had more dust associated with rock strata, which largely composed of silica and silicates. And that rock represents about 37% of the total mining height in the central Appalachian mines and about 16% in non-central Appalachian mines. So that means that the coal seams are thinner in central Appalachia, uh, therefore essentially exposing these miners to more respirable crystalline silica dust than in non-central Appalachian mines. So these findings really drive home the need for respiratory health surveillance of US coal miners. So, uh, do we see the impact of these kinds of working conditions and exposure to respirable crystalline silica dust in our CWHSP data? Here we see a study where there are 532 radiographs were classified as having primary or secondary R type opacities. And this is from the 1980s, so from 1980 through 2018. And we compared the prevalence of R type opacities over time and by region. And when the analysis was restrict, restricted to miners from Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, there was a six-fold increase in the prevalence of R-type opacities across the entire study period. However, we didn't see any increase uh, when excluding radiographs from miners in central Appalachian states. So the rising prevalence of R-type opacities in Appalachian coal miners suggests that respirable crystalline silica exposures in recent decades are an important factor in the resurgence of pneumoconiosis and PMF in the region. So respirable crystalline silica dust, you know, it's playing a role in the resurgence of severe pneumoconiosis in central Appalachia. Effective technologies and best practices do exist for controlling silica and other coal mine dust exposures. Though working as a coal miner is a dusty job as illustrated throughout this talk, Pneumoconiosis is entirely preventable. So prevention starts with limiting exposure to coal mine dust through the use of proper engineering controls and close adherence to ventilation plans, uh, including the use of dust curtains to control air movement, the use of water sprays to prevent excessive dust circulation. And there's also a relatively new technology that's being developed by the NIOSH Pittsburgh Mining Research Division, PMRD, to allow for field-based monitoring of respirable crystalline silica dust at the end of a shift, as opposed to waiting weeks for samples to be sent out to a lab for analysis. So this isn't a compliance tool, but it could be used to supplement compliance measures and provide more real-time feedback on dust exposures at a mine. So all these measures must be properly applied and maintained to protect miners from, de from developing pneumoconiosis. And miners must also continue to be screened for disease in order to diagnose disease early and prevent progression of disease. So overall, this underscores the importance of monitoring and controlling exposure to silica in coal mines and focusing on the health and safety of coal miners. Because uh, this is taken from the act itself, the, the first priority concern of all in the coal mining industry must be the health and safety of its most precious resource the miner. And so the last point I want to make here is offering some perspective and putting a face to this disease. Uh, so in 2008, NIOSH produced a video called Faces of Black Lung, interviewing former coal miners diagnosed with black lung. And here you see Carl, 
uh, on the left on that image on the basis of black lung video, Carl passed away before production of that video could be completed at the age of 58. And on the right is Chester, who was 55 years old at the time of filming. And he did end up having a double lung transplant. And it was his explanted lungs that were featured earlier in the presentation. But unfortunately, he passed away only six months after uh, his transplant. And in early 2020, NIOSH released an updated video, Faces of Black Lung 2, featuring younger minors diagnosed with black lung. Mackie uh, is at the top center there, 39 years old at the time of interview. Ray is in the bottom center in the blue shirt, 48 years old, and Peyton is on the bottom left. He was 42 years old at the time of filming, and we sadly learned that he passed away in September 2019 at the age of 43. So these young men here, I mean, they're just a handful of the minors affected by black lung, minors who suffer from this incurable and yet preventable disease. So with that, I want to thank you for joining me for this talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Hall. Um, quite a serious problem. Um, and you and Dr. Harrison pointed out the, the youth of the, um, the patients that we are seeing in, in regards to this. So uh, I would like to uh, ask Dr. Edwards if um, he could talk a little bit and pose a question to you uh, uh, concerning some of his uh, concerns from, uh, from Australia. Dr. Edwards, can you, can you turn your microphone on, please? Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Yes, we can. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thank both Bob and Naomi for their excellent presentations. And they highlight uh, what I call the, the warm up act uh, for the COVID uh, pandemic, because we really do have a pandemic of res respirable crystalline silica dust related diseases. And it's not just the pneumoconiosis uh, associated with respirable yes. crystalline silica. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, the I, I put into the chat the reference to the the final report of the National Dust Diseases Task Force, which I was a member of, uh, so that you've got the reference to that, and where we've identified uh, from the fifteen hundred workers who have been screened formally, that not counting uh, the. Uh, the others who have been informally screened or not screened at all, where we're seeing a prevalence uh, between you know, 20 to 30 uh, percent. It was my clinic on the Gold Coast that uh, actually first diagnosed the the prevalence of one in three cases, because uh, we saw uh, five, uh, five out of the first uh, seven workers that we were surveying. Uh, having silicosis in one of its various forms. So, uh, so the, the key element from my point of view is that we, we need to identify how can we screen for these workers when we can actually do something about them. As Naomi has pointed out, the, the disease, once it's established, is leading to a, a shortening of in, very young people's lives, as well as the quality of life in the older work with the chronic silicosis. So, the, so what appears to be missing in the equation is how do we pick these people up when we can actually do something about them? Uh, and recognizing that uh, all the exposure standards in the world, I haven't been able to find a, a, a case where they've been compliant with exposure standards. So, uh, so there are a couple of comments. Uh, all I can say is that for both Naomi and Bob, keep up the good work. Thank you very Thanks. much, Dr. Edwards. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Harrison, do you want to comment? No, I was going to just thank Graham for those kind words. Um, I can't agree with you more. Um, in every one of the cases we've had, there has been overexposures. I think if we kept exposures down below 
at least the US permissible limit, which are 50 micrograms. But it's really the challenge about how we do that um, in these in these type of shops. Um, I've, I've, I've taken a lot of lessons from Australia, actually, and the national compensation system and scheme that you set up to offer screening at no charge, from what I understand, to all those who are willing to participate. Um, and um, I also, um, I, I assume or I'd hope that there's some um, assistance in industrial hygiene. Um, I'm, I'm always looking for, for these shops, you know, at least the stone fabrication, what is the secret sauce that we can offer shops to control exposure? Um, and I also am looking for um, um, product uh, reliability and um, responsibility. Um, at last count, I think I found over 50 manufacturers globally, and that's not counting the ones out of China. And they have information along with their products, and yet I go into the shops, and it's like that information hardly exists. They can put it on the safety data sheet, but it doesn't get down to the shop floor and to the shop owner. So Bob, the, we're exploring in Australia, uh, the actual licensing of the sale of the product. Um, we've got the advantage of being able to identify the product as it comes across the shores of Australia into our ports. Uh, and so we can see where it actually lands. So we're looking at uh, some form of point of control and licensing uh, process yeah. so that it can't be, it can't be sold to uh, fabricators, uh, distributors who don't have a compliance uh, mm -hmm. license to handle it. I, I, Graham, I think that's a brilliant idea. Thank you. Yeah, Noemi, can I ask you a question? And, and it's somewhat uh, related to what Dr. Uh, Edwards was just mentioning. What is it in your opinion that would uh, increase the willingness of coal miners to come in and be evaluated by these clinics. Um, I have heard, this is purely anecdotal, that um, in past years, there was a great reluctance, uh, even though many of these miners had severe pulmonary symptoms to go and seek out medical assessment because of fear of losing their jobs. Um, do you know, and has NIOSH um, looked at ways of improving uh, the potential, um, it, the potential for miners to come and seek uh, pulmonary assessments uh, on their health. I mean, do you know? Do you have programs that seem to be effective? I mean, if the answer is yes, I think we'd all like to hear that. Well, I there's a lot to talk about uh, when we're on this topic of minor, are the miners aware of our program at CWHSP of being regularly screened and the availability of that without any cost to themselves. Mm -hmm. And you know, we had uh, recently, I, I remember an RFI where there are a lot of uh, individuals who wrote in and claimed that uh, workers are aware, they know that this program exists, but uh, just this year, we actually did have a contractor who was able to go to some mining communities in West Virginia and give talks about what the CWHSP program is. We were not doing screening at that time because during the pandemic, our mobile unit has not been active. Uh, so we are our mobile unit is not going out to do screening. But of course, the clinics are uh, opened back up or opening back up to provide those radiographic screenings and spirometry although spirometry is definitely challenging. Uh, but that being said, uh, our contractor who was in Southern West Virginia talked to dozens of coal miners who had never heard or claimed that they had never heard of CWHSP and did not know that this program was available to them. Uh, and then when it comes to, so awareness of CWHSP, we do our part at NIOSH to try to do outreach with the coal mines, but as uh, was just being said that you could put it on a safety sheet, you could put it on a bulletin board, but it's very easily ignored if it's not brought to the attention uh, of the coal miners. And then of course, you have to have trust of the miners. 
to participate in this program because it is voluntary for them. It's not right. mandated. Right. Uh, but they have to trust that their information will be confidential, which of course right. we keep that uh, information confidential. And uh, there's also, <laughs> when it comes to when you screen somebody early and they do have signs of pneumoconiosis and relatively early in their progression, uh, what option is available to them? They don't mm -hmm. want to lose their job. What they can do is take advantage of the Part 90 program. And we recently uh, published on uh, Part 90 uh, about minors who had participated in the program. And unfortunately, very few minors who are eligible, who have pneumoconiosis identified on the radiographs, very few participate in Part 90. Um, and that's, I, I didn't bring that up in this talk here, but that's also really uh, fascinating because then the question is, well, if they know they have pneumoconiosis or they have evidence of it on their radiograph, um, then why wouldn't they take advantage of Part 90? As some minors are eligible for Part 90 early on in their careers and hold on to that right to exercise Part 90 until they're near retirement because they do fear that participating in Part 90 will mark them and they will soon, and again, this is talking to coal miners, that they fear that um, they will be let go for unrelated reasons mm -hmm. because they've exercised Part 90 rights. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, so there's, uh, I can see there's a lot of questions here and I've talked quite a bit. So yeah, I'm there's a, there. Dr. Kevin Hedges, can you uh, unmute yourself and make a very brief question, please? Dr. Hedges, thank you. Oh, sorry, I was just putting something in the chat box. <clears throat> so I've lived in uh, Canada for now, but over 10 years, but I did quite a bit of work in uh, Queensland in quarries and dimension stone mines. <clears throat> and I did actually have an easy one spirometer. And I did, you know, I had a small study group look, between 40 and 50 workers. And I actually uh, measured their exposure to respirable crystalline silica. And I also did spirometry at the same time Sorry, Kevin, can you do a question, please? Sorry, yeah, we're just all, running all out I'm, of time all, is the problem. All I'm saying is that it's it's interesting that through Dr. Hall's presentation that she talked about spirometry being included in health surveillance in 2016. I'm surprised that it hasn't been there for a much longer time. And it's like, you know, a lot of things, it's another tool in the toolbox. And it's good to have all of these different measures. So that was my question. Right. Dr. LeBlanc. Can you unmute and make your question really quick, please? It was not a question. It was more an observation. I had discussion with the uh, deputy of, an, of uh, public health here in Quebec, Canada, and it's about uh, getting C of A's and permits for, uh, you know, you know how much it's controlled with respect to the EPA. You cannot emit that much particulate or that much contaminant outside of your building. But when it's inside of your building, you don't have any control or permit to get as long as you maintain it into, inside your facility. So at some point I said to the deputy that why don't we ask to when there's a request for a COA or, for, or a permit that the, the company not just talk about what are going to be the emission, but what's going to stay inside of the building and how can you, they protect their worker. And that's, again, it's more documents, more paperwork, but at least it protects worker. Thank you. Right, right. Shilpi Misra, really quickly, a question, please. Yeah, for Noemi, I was thinking about the slide that you had from Brent Downey's article, and I'm wondering your thoughts on the lag with MSHA inspectors um, getting the results back, not only sampling, getting the results back, but um, you know, the difference between big operations and small operations that may not have a industrial hygienist or safety team at their mine operation, like how do you see, um, you know, daily sampling um, for overexposures possible um, when mine operations or, or, you know, just operations in general don't have a person to do it? And this isn't like a, you have to solve this problem. I'm just curious, like, do you think that that's a major barrier for like updated on um, you know, very timely data. 
yeah, that they don't have real time data to say, okay, we need to update what's happening right now, as opposed to, oh, it turns out two weeks ago, we were cutting way too much uh, rock. Right, right, day-to-day -day changes versus exactly. month to month, year to year changes, yes. Yeah, so the PMRD, again, Pittsburgh Mining Research Division of NIOSH, they, that, that tool that they're developing is not yet a compliance tool, but if that could be used uh, in the field, I think that if it's, it would have to be in such a way that um, not just industrial hygienists would be able to utilize it, but others could be trained to use it and act quickly on that, on those results. So yeah, thank you. Again, um, I, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk about cancer and uh, other chronic diseases um, linked with uh, silica exposure. And um, let's hope that this works. Um, I do want to uh, say that uh, Workplace Health Without Borders has got a, uh, a website. We'd love to have you explore it. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we'd love to have you uh, join us and, and become a member. So that my objectives are to provide some epidemiology data describing the risks of silica exposure related to lung cancer and other malignancies, cancer risk after silicosis and coworkers pneumoconiosis and lung cancer rel risks related to silica exposure and non-smokers and a very brief uh, mention of uh, autoimmune diseases. I also want to uh, talk about the risk of silica tuberculosis uh, in South Africa, and also some new findings about railroad workers, um, and they have exposure uh, to silica as well. So, as we know, uh, the inhalation of uh, crystalline silica causes silicosis, silico tuberculosis, co workers pneumoconiosis, and other diseases. And um, this is a couple of years old, at about 300 deaths per year, but we certain that that's seriously underestimated uh, in the United States. Um, in the US, there's approximately two to three million workers who are exposed more or less um, on a regular basis. And that, if you look on it worldwide, is closer to 100 million. That would include uh, mining, coal mining, construction, uh, metallurgy and foundry, ceramics, agriculture, uh, sandblasting and countertop manufacturing. And there is evidence since the mid 1980s that workplace silica exposure can uh, be considered a multi potential health hazard in that it, it produces health effects like smoking and asbestos does of several different types. So I want to focus in my talk about research done since IARC labeled silica as a known or a, what's called a type one carcinogen. And we'll look at lung and other cancers. We'll talk about this um, very good uh, and interesting study of silico tuberculosis in South African miners. You already heard from Dr. Harrison about um, accelerated silicosis, but included in that are autoimmune diseases that some of the countertop workers are dealing with as well. And I also want to uh, mention, uh, along with Dr. Harrison, the importance of sampling and measuring quartz uh, levels as um, a very important uh, key to going forward. So with regards to agency decisions on the policy side, um, there have been two that I want to draw your attention to. The first is the International Agency for Research on Cancer judged the evidence on silica as probable in 1986. And in 1997 and 2012, they met again and, um, and considered the evidence and judged silica to be a known or a type one carcinogen. Um, in March of 2016, uh, OSHA, uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in the US um, developed um, a new, or proposed a new standard of 50 micrograms per cubic meter of air, which is about one half of the prior uh, standard. And um, for those of you who are interested in looking at that language, here is the URL for that. And then uh, after that, 
the industry challenged the OSHA, the new OSHA standard, uh, and uh, that was decided by um, the uh, DC Court of Appeals in 2017, and they rejected all of the uh, industry arguments uh, related to the uh, administration of the new silica dust standard. So uh, some reflections uh, on the uh, 1997 and 2012 uh, assessment. Other agencies, including California's Proposition 65, the National Toxicology Program, NIOSH, the American Thoracic Society, and the European Union recognize the strength of the evidence um, presented by IARC. And I have uh, recently completed a, a chapter in an occupational medicine textbook uh, that's coming out next year where this is going to be discussed in a, in a much more full, uh, full, measure, full measure. In the new OSHA standard, all silica was recognized as being linked with autoimmune diseases, um, nephritis and kidney disease, as well as um, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. So uh, I'm going to briefly go ask this clinical picture because you guys have already gotten um, the, um, the real stuff uh, from Dr. Hall's presentation. I wanna very briefly talk about an, an earlier study that I was involved with uh, for claimants in California from 1946 to 1991 for silicosis. We did a follow-up study uh, after they had filed claims. And um, I just wanna draw your attention to uh, several um, interesting um, findings in the middle. The standardized mortality ratio um, is very high for tuberculosis, 56.4 SMR. There's a 3.8 uh, risk for non-malignant respiratory disease. There's a 3.4 risk for emphysema, and there's a 6.8 risk for silicosis and other chronic respiratory diseases. There's also a 1.3 risk uh, SMR for all causes of death. Uh, and um, this is the um, follow-up for cancers. So all malignant neoplasms have got a similarly raised uh, 1.22 SMR. Um, the interesting findings are for the malignant neoplasms of the large intestine has an SMR of 2.1 and respiratory system 2.0, and cancer of the lung 1.9. Other cancers like prostate um, are significantly low. And um, this gives you some sense uh, of data um, uh, prior to the IARC evaluation uh, in 1996. Um, I do want to draw our attention to a very strong paper that was done by Kyle Steenland in 2001, and colleagues, by the way, when they looked at 10 cohort studies of lung cancer, um, including uh, studies of diatomaceous earth workers and uh, South African gold miners, granite workers, and Chinese uh, studies of tin, tungsten, pottery workers, and also Australian uh, gold. And I mentioned South African gold miners. These are all very high quality studies um, that um, enabled Dr. Steenland uh, to, to do two things. One is uh, do a categorical analysis um, by exposure quintiles. And the risk, as you can see, uh, by quintile goes from 1 to 1.3 to 1.5 to 1.6 at the highest exposure quintile. And that allows us also to take a look at this very striking um, figure that Dr. Steenland put together, which shows that basically uh, for several years, uh, up to eight years, there isn't really much change in the log of the rate ratio. But after that, it rises rather dramatically uh, to show that um, the longer exposure to silica dust in these 10 cohorts, the, the risk of lung cancer rises rather uh, clearly. And uh, keep in mind, by the way, that this is a, a data where the uh, lag of e exposure was lagged by 15 years. This is the best fitting uh, curve. 
So now I want to turn to uh, some other studies. These are all uh, studies that have been published since uh, 1997, 2000, when IARC called silica a known human carcinogen. This first one is by Cassidy et al. in 2007. This is a European multi-centered case control study. And for females, the odds ratio, this is an adjusted odds ratio, um, produces a, a risk of 2.07, which is not quite statistically significant for males, 1.32, which is significant. Uh, never smokers has a risk of 1.4, and ex-smokers, 1.3, uh, and current smokers, 1.41. Then um, Cassidy and colleagues then uh, looked at some exposure data. And as you can see, the greater the exposure um, in milligrams per cubic meter, the higher the risk. And the highest uh, level, greater than 200 milligrams per cubic meter, uh, provides an odds ratio of 2.08, which, and when you take a look at all four of those, you get a, a um, p-value for exposure trend, uh, which is highly statistically significant. Zika did another study in 2006, studied the risk of silica, uh, the role of silica in a case control study of non-smoking lung cancers. And they looked at uh, two um, exposure um, matrices. One was up to eight years, of silica exposure, that gives you an adjusted odds ratio of 1.2. But for greater than eight years silica exposure, the odds ratio is 2.39. In the latter case, that is statistically significant. They also did um, a frequency index year uh, to evaluate the uh, sort of cumulative exposure uh, to these frequent, uh, a frequency index evaluation and for up to 42.1 frequency index years has an adjusted odds ratio of 1.11 and greater than 42.1 frequency index years gives you an adjusted odds ratio, which is statistically significant of 2.45. So again, keeping in mind, these are, um, these are uh, non-smoking lung cancer uh, cases. There was, in addition to that, a study from Hong Kong of several hundred, um, not several hundred, uh, more than a hundred um, non-smoking lung cancer cases. And that also showed an increased risk for uh, silica exposure. And my apologies, I didn't have time to put that in this slide. There have been um, other studies of silicosis patients uh, and the earliest ones were done by Finkelstein et al. in Canada in 1980 and Peter Westerholm in Sweden uh, Finkelstein was 1982, my apologies, Westerholm in 1980. Both of these studies were the earliest studies that showed a link between silicosis and a, um, a follow-on risk for lung cancer. There have been several meta-analyses showing an approximately doubling of lung cancer risk for workers with silicosis. And um, there is epidemiology evidence for an increased risk for for skin, lymphatic, GI tumors, kidney cancers amongst uh, groups with silicosis and with silica exposure as well. And lastly, kidney disease has been linked um, with um, silicosis and with um, silica exposure as well. So kidney disease needs to be put on uh, to that list of silica-linked health effects. What about the risk of uh, after diagnosis, um, there's a paper by Yin et al. from 2018 found an excess rate of latent TB among Chinese patients with poll workers pneumoconiosis. And that's been found with my many other authors. I also want to draw your attention to a study from the Czech Republic um, from uh, Thomas Skova in 2000, et al. from 2017. They studied uh, poll workers pneumoconiosis patients and they found an SMR of 1.7, which was uh, statistically significant, and also um, non-malignant respiratory disease uh, after a diagnosis of CWP, leading to an SMR of 2.78. This is also uh, statistically significant. There was an earlier study uh, from 1991 
but for time reasons, I think we'll just uh, skip over that. Um, there is one um, very important study that I want to dwell on for a bit. Uh, Liu et al. published this paper in 2013. It is worth mentioning that Dr. Steenland is a co-author. He did, Liu et al. did a very large 44-year follow-up study of 34,000 Chinese tungsten iron, uh, tungsten and iron miners and ceramic workers that included over 11,000 deaths and 546 pulmonary cancers. And overall, they had a very strong um, silica gradient for uh, lung cancer with a 25-year lag. The hazard ratios were 1.26, 1.54, 1.68, and 1.70. These included those uh, in the lung cancer group who had silicosis as well as um, subjects who didn't have silicosis. The authors were able to exclude 427, 427 cases among the lung cancer that also had silicosis, uh, leaving a group of 119 uh, for follow-up. And um, what they were able to show was that there's a cumulative quartile of exposure produced a dose-response relationship um, for, uh, uh, for uh, five groups of silicosis that, go, that produces a risk to one, 1.12, 1.41, 1.58, and 1.70. And um, I, I believe that this is an extraordinarily strong study for the fact that when they pulled out uh, patients who they had x-ray evidence of silicosis, they still had a dose-response relationship for uh, silica exposure in this lung cancer group without silicosis. Um, this has been an argument that the industry has put forward as the only possibility uh, of something uh, being causally related when in fact uh, the study by Liu et al. Uh, basically puts that to rest that um, their findings um, show that both um, lung cancer cases mixed with silicosis and lung cancer cases without silicosis both show clear-cut dose response gradients um, in, in this, uh, in this uh, very strong study. I also want to um, uh, share with you a study uh, by Maycall et al. Uh, from 2010. This is for autoimmune diseases. And um, it's very important to recognize uh, Dr. Kenneth Rosenman, who's been the head of the Michigan uh, Silicosis Registry for many, many years and has been a leader in this field. Um, they found in 2010, 33 cases of rheumatoid arthritis amongst the Michigan silicosis producing a relative risk of nearly seven, only one case of lupus, uh, which produced a relative risk of 2.53, which of course is not significant. Two cases of scleroderma producing a relative risk of 28.3, which is statistically significant scleroderma, being a very rare uh, disease, and two cases of Sjogren's syndrome producing a relative risk of 0 0.42, and six cases of vasculitis producing a relative risk of 25, which is uh, statistically significant. So um, this is a, a very uh, important finding uh, that shows that autoimmune diseases um, in in parallel to what um, Dr. Harrison was talking about is a serious outcome uh, after diagnosis of silicosis. Now I want to briefly uh, share with you this uh, paper um, that uh, was done by Enlovu, and I apologize for mispronouncing this uh, author's last name, published uh, with colleagues in 2018. In South Africa, they created this um, really powerful pathology automation system, sometimes known by its initials as PathHot, uh, that collects autopsy materials from miners of all races. And this enables um, the very strong epidemiology studies to be undertaken. Uh, Dr. Nlovu and colleagues in 2018 studied 
uh, over 53,000 black and over uh, nearly 31,000 white autopsies. Uh, these are amongst those who had defined silicosis. And th their question was, how many of them contract um, pulmonary tuberculosis or what is sometimes referred to as silico TB? And the, the, the authors found that they had an adjusted odds ratio for black miners of 3.08, which was statistically significant. And for white miners, it was 2.21, also statistically uh, significant. And this is a very important um, occupational and public health issue um, because um, in, in South Africa, they are really trying uh, to make sure that um, minors with silicosis uh, received anti-tuberculosis um, treatments uh, as a preventive in order to uh, um, save these workers from uh, later contracting silico tuberculosis. And this is, as I said, a national, um, a, a national program that's going on ongoing. Um, and so I now want to briefly share with you some new findings that just got published earlier in 2021. This is a study of um, maintenance of way railroad workers who have the responsibility uh, for putting a ballast, high silica containing um, gravel, sand and gravel on the tracks of railroads uh, throughout the United States. These are all unionized workers. Uh, this is a, an easier to understand picture of the type of exposure that um, the right of way workers have. You can see the workers in the back are standing around, looks like they're having a break right behind um, this, um, uh, this um, dust uh, cloud that's being put up by the, uh, the laying of, of uh, uh, this gravel on, on the railroad tracks. This is uh, selected TMR proportionate mortality ratios and SMR for maintenance of way railroad workers from 1979 to 2014, um, published um, just in uh, Occupational Medicine, the British Journal. We found excess uh, elevated S TMRs and SMRs for nephritis. Uh, we found an elevated SMR for COPD. We found elevated risks for in the PMR and in the SMR for diabetes. And um, uh, we had a, an elevated SMR for all malignant neoplasms, including lung cancer and stomach cancer and kidney cancer, all of which um, have been linked in the past uh, to uh, ballast exposure and silica exposure uh, in, in uh, other workplaces. And we found uh, this to be elevated in, in our uh, follow-up studies of the maintenance of way workers. So in looking at all of this, the IARC's ranking of silica as a carcinogen has been backed up by studies confirming the risks, including studies of women and non-smokers. Follow-up studies of workers with CWP and silicosis suggest they're at very high risk for TB, especially in South Africa, and subsequent COPD mortality. They are also at increased risk for um, lung cancer, and, and with uh, linkages to gastrointestinal and kidney cancer as well. And I just shared with you this ballast study uh, showing increased risk for COPD, nephritis, um, diabetes, stomach and kidney cancer. Um, but, and it's important to recognize that the SMR analysis is only for workers who are age 65 and less, and the PMR is for all ages. So um, we don't see um, complete parallelism there, but in several cases, uh, we do. So in conclusion, we know that workers who are suffering from co-workers mm -hmm. pneumoconiosis and silicosis are a problem in several countries. Uh, and, and Dr. Harrison mentioned the US, Australia, Israel, but there's also China and, and other countries. We know that patients with CWP and silicosis are at increased risk for autoimmune diseases and lung cancer but we also know that there are more studies that need to be done. Uh, the autoimmune diseases are rarer 
and hence there's more difficulty <coughs> in getting a sufficient uh, number to study. Um, we know that those with silicosis alone are at increased risk of tuberculosis, lung cancer, and other cancers. And we need additional uh, morbidity and mortality studies of countertop workers, including and focusing on exposure disease linkages. And I want to ask this question to my colleagues um, on the pathology side. Are there pathological differences between lung tumors among silicotics and silica-exposed workers compared to garden variety lung cancers? Um, this is something where I think uh, we really do need some research to try and identify clearly what are the silica-related uh, tumors and can they be differentiated from other types of lung tumors. And um, as uh, mentioned uh, by my colleagues, we need our agencies, OSHA, MSHA, and NIOSH to provide the leadership to study the health of workers in the U.S. and to um, undertake other studies in countries such as South Africa and China, where we know that there are these concerns about silica-related illnesses. So I mentioned that I would like to invite everybody who's on the line still. We'd love to have you join us. Um, please browse over to whwb-usa.org and check out our website. Uh, we have very low dues, especially for students. We have projects related to other issues like sustainable fashion, nail salons, global asbestos policy, industrial hygiene monitoring, COVID in the workplace, and occupational safety and health training. And we would love to have your participation. We have student chapters at BYU, University of Michigan, and George Washington. And George Washington is going to have its first um, meeting uh, next week for the 21-22 academic year. And if you want more information about that, please contact me. Um, and we will also have a new jobs listing uh, coming up on our website, I hope, very soon. At any rate, I um, tried to make sure that I finished before 7 o'clock, and I did it by one minute. So um, we certainly could take questions if there are questions. And I'll just um, uh, be happy to, um, if anyone's put them in the chair, chat box, we can certainly see what's going on. <laughs>